Hi everyone, we are going to discuss drugs used to treat disorders of the gastrointestinal tract, starting with things that will be used to treat uh, reflux and ulcer disease. In order to understand how these medications work, we will first go over the general gastric acid secretion in the stomach and if you understand the physiology behind the way we produce acid, it makes understanding the way that these medications work very easily digestible. Uh, no pun intended, but definitely appreciated. So let's get started. This talk, again, is going to focus on the minimum learning objectives for this general class of medications. We'll start with the basic GI physiology and the, again, the secretory functions of the stomach and the esophagus and intestines to some degree. But if we understand gastric acid secretion and some characteristics of the acid and some characteristics of the stomach itself that resist the very low pH environment that exists inside of it when this acid is released, and how that gastric area of the body is different than other parts of the alimentary canal. We really don't see any other part uh, that's similar to the lining of the stomach in its ability to withstand these low pH environments. And uh, for those of you who love cellular level things like me, we'll talk about some different transporter proteins. There's a transporter protein called a symporter, and we'll see what that means if you've never encountered that term before. And also, I want you to be familiar with the receptor subtypes associated with acid secretion. Um, those receptor subtypes are going to house the pumps and the binding receptor sites for the various compounds that we will either be decreasing or antagonizing in some way. And as mentioned, these medications will be used to treat things like reflux or GERD, gastrointestinal reflux disorder, and also PUD, PUD, fun to say, which is uh, peptic ulcer disease, and also dyspepsia in some cases, though that doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect for dyspepsia, but it, they can be used. These drugs you'll see are easier to chunk together than other drug classes because their endings are quite similar to one another, so they should be relatively easy to pick out. So when we think about the gastrointestinal tract, that is technically going to involve everything from the mouth to the anus. And the physiology, remember, is the functional portion of this. So the physiology of this system is really to complete digestion. And if we were to define digestion, we would define it by calling it the breakdown of macromolecular structures into their usable components, which are micromolecular. So we don't consume things like plain old vitamin A. We eat a carrot that contains other things besides vitamin A, lots of fibers, uh, the plant cell wall, so these cellulose types of things, and that is taken into the body and then broken down first in the mouth, which is obviously not pictured here, but it will be broken down by mastication, which is chewing, and mixed together with saliva to make something called a bolus, which is basically chewed up food mixed with saliva. And the saliva also contains an enzyme called salivary amylase, amylase. And amylase is an enzyme responsible for the breaking down of carbohydrates. So once we have that bolus, so you're not supposed to swallow food without chewing it fully. Sometimes it's hard not to do that, but ideally the more you chew it, uh, the easier it is to move through your body. Also, the reason why you are supposed to chew when you talk to those people who tell you to go on diets, um, you also have a muscle fatigue message for satiety. 
So meaning if you chew a lot, your jaw gets tired. So you think you're full a little bit sooner than perhaps you are, which is why you see diet foods containing things like celery and carrots. Not only do they have low caloric volumes, but they also are very, very crunchy and take a lot of muscle energy to break down. Um, yeah, so there's that. So we're going to break that stuff down into a bolus, and the bolus is going to move down the esophagus. And it moves through the esophagus through peristalsis, which is a propulsatory movement that is in one direction. There is no reverse peristalsis in the esophagus food or in this type of area, it is the bolus is moved down in a way that the body uh, typically works, which is where muscle when stretched responds by contracting. So stretch leads to contraction. And I have many other talks that go into this, but essentially what you have is the bolus moving through here. And as it moves through the esophagus, it's stretching this portion in front of it and that will signal to that muscle because it's just like a rubber band in this way when it's stretched it wants to go back to its normal conformation so when stretched it responds by contracting so the contraction follows the bolus essentially at like a wave where there is a, a leading uh, almost dilation and then a lagging contraction behind it to move everything down from the esophagus into the stomach. Um, if everything doesn't go down the first try, the first wave of peristalsis, there is a secondary wave of peristalsis. Your body doesn't just give up. It will continue peristaltic waves to move down that bolus of food. All right. Well, we're talking about the esophagus. I will mention this for the first time. There are two sphincters associated with the esophagus. There's an upper esophageal sphincter, which opens when you swallow so that when you push your tongue onto the top of your mouth and <laughs> swallow that food back into your pharynx area, it will force the opening of that upper esophageal sphincter. And then we have peristalsis, again, moving the bolus down, and it'll move it down till we get to the lower esophageal sphincter, which controls passage of things from the esophagus into the stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter is generally closed, but it does open once the bolus gets to this area and we have that stretch occurring and through a variety of mechanisms mediated by things like the vagus nerve. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic system work together to allow the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which we call the LES for short, and the lower esophageal sphincter opens as things move into the stomach from the esophagus, and then it should close, right? Yes, the correct answer is yes. It should close once the bolus has then entered the stomach. So at the top of the stomach, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, which essentially lines what's called the esophageal hiatus. And hiatus, like I take a hiatus from things, it's like a break in something. So like a break within the normal configuration of the stomach is where the esophagus hitches into the stomach. So that's called the esophageal hiatus. So the lower esophageal sphincter lines the portion of the lower esophagus and it relaxes when food is moving into the stomach and then it closes right up afterwards. There is a sphincter at the bottom of the stomach to contain things within the stomach so they don't just go and dump on in to the small intestines here without being digested. There is a variety of things that can cause that and fun name, it's called dumping disorder when the pylorus isn't completely closed and undigested food is allowed to move on to the small intestine. But otherwise, it's the stomach's job to break down that bolus into a substance we call chyme. And chyme is 
again, the bolus is saliva plus food products. So now we have the bolus, so saliva and food. To that will be added stomach acid and the other water type substances made by the various cells in the stomach. And that will work on the bolus to eventually become the chyme. And chyme is very similar in consistency to cake batter, brownie batter, and this whole process in the stomach is similar to making brownies or cake. If you think of putting your dry ingredients into the wet ingredients and then mixing them together until they become a batter consistency, that's the job of your stomach. So the stomach is making acid, it's making water, and we call that chemical digestion. We'll get more into this later. Um, but basically chemicals that break down macromolecular structures into micromolecular structures are involved in chemical digestion, whereas muscle movement is involved in what we call mechanical digestion. And when we were talking about the mouth and chewing, that's a form of mechanical digestion. So mechanical digestion in the mouth, forming the bolus, and then in the stomach, we have the acids working on the bolus to turn it into chyme. So we've got chemical digestion there. And at the same time, the walls of the stomach, which are lined with muscle in this middle layer of it, they are also churning. And so that is some mechanical digestion as well. So there's muscle and acid working on the bolus to turn it into chyme. Once we have reached the desired consistency of the chyme, which is also going to be associated with an ideal pH, um, that will signal to various parts of the body, we'll talk about later, that it is time for the chyme to move on. And the chyme will move on by allowing the pylorus to relax a little bit, and then just a couple of milliliters at a time, we're going to eject through this, again, this peristalsis that's going to happen with the stomach, this one-way propulsive movement. We're going to squeeze like a tube of toothpaste, the stomach from the middle. The muscle will squeeze it on both sides and start ejecting that chyme into the first area of the small intestine called the duodenum. So one important thing to remember as we go along about the duodenum, the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. The small intestine is not lined with the same really strong lining that you see inside of the stomach. That gastric lining is very strong and it helps the stomach withstand the very low pH acid that is created there. And a typical pH for stomach acid can be anywhere between one, I've drawn too much in there, let me go over here, one to 3.5 in the pH scale. And you might know that the pH in generally, you know, the rest of the body should be about 7.4. So if we're dealing with a really low acid environment, then, uh, then that's a big difference, right? So I want you to keep in mind that this duodenum right here it does not have that same lining that the stomach does. So the stomach is equipped to handle low pH, the duodenum is not. That becomes important later. All right, so once we have chyme, uh, that will move on to the small intestine, which is the main site of absorption. That's where everything is absorbed into the bloodstream. And remember, things flow from high to low concentration. So anything good uh, that we want to suck into the body will generally be in high concentration when it's in the small intestines, but it would be in low concentration in the body. So it should, should passively flow through the bloodstream from the small intestine to the bloodstream in the general periphery. So the small intestine is the main site of absorption and the main part of the small intestine that absorbs the most is the duodenum because that's the first stop. So it has the highest concentration gradient inside versus outside. And 
things take a couple of hours, several hours to move through the small intestine, uh, depending upon the contents of the food. Once it makes it through the small intestine, all of the absorption should be done. All the good stuff has been sucked out. So by the time we move from the small intestine to the large intestine, a process which is allowed by the opening of the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal sphincter, which is named very nicely, if I may say so, the ileal, so that is referring to the ileum or the most distal or final portion of the small intestine, meeting the first part of the colon or the large intestine called the cecum. So the ileocecal valve is the meeting point between these two pieces of the small and then large intestine. And by the time that chyme moves from small to large intestine, again, it should only be waste products, some dead cells from the lining of the GI tract that have sloughed off in this process. The water should have been absorbed by this time, all the nutrients, all the good stuff. So by the time it gets to the colon, it's really not going to lose anything else from it. Um, the only thing that can really be absorbed from the colon generally is water. So again, the main site of water absorption is in the small intestine, but that's the only thing the colon's going to absorb. And you might know the longer things stay in the colon, the more water is absorbed. And you can uh, determine this by how, I was gonna say stanky, but I shouldn't say how stank something is, but how foul smelling the stool is. The That means more bacteria has broken it down, which is going to increase uh, the gaseousness of the fecal material because bacteria digest things uh, via fermentation, which makes gases and doesn't necessarily smell great. And also, not only would the stool be more uh, foul smelling, it'll also be more firm, um, which can lead to constipation. So ideally, we would want to have, you know, two to three bowel movements a day to keep everything moving and not retain it there for too long. So we had food, bolus, chyme, and then the chyme moving to the small intestine <clears throat> until it gets to the colon where it will turn or mature into a feces. So look at my messy picture. If I've written that much, you know that it's, uh, that it's good learning right there. All right, so to just tie these digestive processes together, um, we are also going to name or add another name to just the gastrointestinal tract because technically GI, gastrointestinal, is referring to the stomach and the intestines. And we've got some more things besides that, right? So the entire lumen, and remember a lumen is not just a unit of how bright light or something is. A lumen is a tube, a continuous tube. So if we're thinking of a paper towel roll, uh, that cardboard brown roll at the center, that would be the lumen, okay? So the alimentary canal describes this continuous lumen, again, that starts at the mouth and goes down to the rectum and then the opening, which is the anus. So the alimentary canal, fun fact about it, and there's probably only one fun fact about it, um, is that it is technically external to the body, right? That's crazy because it's a lumen that goes right through the center of the body. How is it external when it's clearly inside? Well, if you think about when you go to a checkup and you're sick and you're making a lot of mucus and they tell you uh, that you can either blow your nose or you can swallow it. And you're like, oh, gross. Like, why would I want to swallow my sputum that's gross but remember once things make it into the stomach right here they're just going to be broken down with acid and then it's going to become feces and feces is something that we call excrement meaning it is excreted from the body all right so 
there are two different processes that I will define for you right now. When we talk about secretion, when things are secreted, they are going into the body, like into the bloodstream or whatever. When things are excreted, that means that they're moving outside of the body. So technically, when we think about things uh, that are being created and moved into the GI tract, we're talking about an excretory process because it is taking out all the nutrients from whatever is swallowed, absorbing it, and then excreting the rest. So we can we consider this external to the body, even though it is you know, physically inside of it. Physiologically, it is external. And again, I've mentioned this, but very quickly, digestion is the whole point of this system. And digestion is breaking things down into their usable parts. We take in things as macromolecular structures, and then the various processes break them down into micromolecular forms. And that digestion can either be mechanical, using muscle, or it can be chemical, using chemicals, right? Like acid. So when we put things into the mouth, we chew it. That's mechanical digestion. It's breaking it down with our muscles. Then there's saliva added with some enzyme in it. So that's chemical digestion. Then the food or the bolus at this point moves down the esophagus. There's no mechanical digestion there. The only muscle movement that occurs is peristalsis. So we would say that unlike the mouth, which does muscle mastication or chewing and secretes water out to break down the food, and then also this um, salivary amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates. So that is clearly going to be involved in chemical digestion. But the esophagus, the only thing it makes is mucus, and the specific type of mucus it makes is uh, for lubrication, so that the bolus doesn't get stuck on anything as it moves through the esophagus. And the type of muscles in the esophagus, there are two types. There are ring-like muscles or circular muscles that line the esophagus that go in this direction. And then there are longitudinal muscles that go up and down. And these do this very coordinated dance to dilate in front of the bolus, contract behind it, and then the longitudinal muscle acts as a syncytium, which if you remember, is a tissue that works together as a sheet. So it functions together. And these two things work either incrementally, like with the circular muscle, or together as a sheet so that a big wave of peristalsis can assist in the movement of the bolus. So that is not a mixing movement, that's what we call a propulsatory movement. It's moving the bolus from the top of the esophagus after the upper esophageal sphincter down to the lower esophageal sphincter that will open to allow passage into the stomach. All right, so again, in the mouth we have chemical and mechanical digestion. In the esophagus, we don't have any digestion happening. We just have the movement, this forward peristaltic movement of the bolus. Then when we get to the stomach, we have both chemical and mechanical digestion. So as the bolus moves into the stomach and is worked upon to become chyme, we have stomach acids that are going to be secreted. Um, there are two main acid types within the stomach. There is pepsin and pepsin for simplicity's sake, let's just think about pepsin, the P in pepsin. I want you to remember P for protein. So that's the acid that is very good at digesting protein. And the other acid in the stomach is HCl, hydrochloric acid. And both of these, when at their fullest expression, so when they are being uh, secreted to their max amount, can lead to this pH of about one and a half to three.
There's also a lot of water secretion into the stomach to aid in making it a very soluble type of chyme. Uh, the more bulky and watery it is, the easier it's going to be for the small intestines to absorb the needed nutrients from there. All right. As the acid is being created in the stomach, there is a concurrent mixing movement. And this in the stomach is called churning. The stomach, <laughs> everything just kind of contracts at various points to mix up the contents of the stomach, kind of like if you filled a bag, um, like a Ziploc bag with pancake batter and water. So like the mix of pancake batter, pancake mix and water and used your hands to kind of squish it around in the bag. That's the way that your stomach uh, works to break things down. And it does that until we get the correct pH and consistency that's detected by the mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors inside of the lining of the stomach. And that'll send sensory messages up uh, through the vagus nerve to various brain centers to alert the body that it's time to move the chyme on. And so the churning or the mecha the mechanical form of digestion will halt and the stomach will then engage in its propulsatory movement, which is not digestion related. It's not breaking anything down. Propulsatory movements move things from point A to point B. So the stomach engages then in peristalsis to slowly squeeze bits of chyme into the small intestine. So the small intestine isn't on my list over here. I don't know why I did that, but who knows why I do anything. Not me is the answer. So the small intestine is, as we mentioned, the main site of absorption. There is definitely mechanical absorption in the small intestines. There's peristalsis that can actually happen in both directions there. Not in a full reverse in that you can move things from the small intestine up to the stomach because we still have the pyloric sphincter blocking the passage of things from the small intestine back up into the stomach. The system isn't really made for reverse. So as we'll see in a little bit, like when the liver makes bile, the bile is delivered into the small intestine. So if somebody says they threw up bile, it's usually not the case. If somebody is vomiting up bile, that means something's really physiologically wrong to allow the movement of bile upwards in a system that's not designed to promote backflow. Um, so once something's in the small intestine, it should remain there. So the pylorus should be closed again at this point. It's usually closed. It should be closed anytime there's something in the stomach. It is only partially opened um, in times when the stomach is empty to allow the quick transit of movement. So that if you were dehydrated, for example, and you drank water, if there's no food in the stomach, the water can freely pass down through the pylorus to the small intestine and be absorbed to better uh, correct your homeostatic imbalance. If there's any food in the stomach, then the pylorus is closed. So same thing with the small intestine. When things are moving through the small intestine, especially when they're in the duodenum, the pylorus is only really open every once in a while to allow the incremental transit of chyme into the small intestine. And the small intestine, some of its cells do make specialized secretory products for digestion, but mainly those cells produce mucus, which uh, is going to aid in coating the small intestine so that things it's called slippage. It promotes slippage, meaning that things slip through the small intestines rather than you know, adhering to the wall. Um, and also the other things that it helps with are fecal adherence, which is a little bit more pronounced in the colon, but it's essentially um, going to promote um, the formation of stool. And that starts a little bit in the small intestine um, with this production of certain mucus products. So the mechanical digestion is this peristalsis that happens in two ways to really mix up the food and break it down. And that's called segmentation. 
segmentation is the mixing movement in the small intestines, segmentation. And the reason my writing is always so messy on here, if you're wondering, is because if I place my hand at any point on this, it messes up. So I have to hold my wrist and arm suspended in the air to write on it. So in case you are wondering kind of life problems I have, that's one of them. But that's why my writing is always so ridiculous looking. So anyways, that's our moving um, or our mixing movement, our mechanical digestion. And then there's also regular old peristalsis in the small intestines to move things along. All right. And then when we get to the large intestine, again, that transit between the small and large intestine is controlled by the ileocecal valve or ileocecal sphincter, which prevents backflow of things from the colon back up into the small intestine. We don't want that to happen because once things have made it to the large intestine, um, it should just be waste, all right, so there's, again, there's dead cells. There are things that we're not good at absorbing. Um, so it's just our waste things at this time. And the only thing that we'll see secreted by cells in the large intestine is, again, mucus. There's a lot of mucus made in the large intestines. There's a couple different types if you're interested. So there's one to uh, encourage slippage. And then, again, another one uh, that encourages fecal adherence. So the formation of a stool rather than a watery stool, which you probably know as diarrhea. We don't want that, right? <laughs> nobody wants that for themselves, maybe your enemies. It's a good thing to wish upon them. That being said, normally the main type of uh, movement in the large intestines is, it's called shuttling. It's a great term, shuttling. And the shuttling is a slow movement of at this point, stool really moving throughout the colon. So up the ascending, the transverse, down to the descending. And there's about three really vigorous um, contractions that occur throughout the day where it, it's they're called mass movements, which I hear a lot on the news, like this is a mass movement. And I giggle like a kindergartner because mass movements are what we refer to as the movement of things in the colon to make poo. But anyways, a mass movement is not just this slow incremental shuttling that we see. Instead, it's one big wave of peristalsis that would move the stool from like here to here. And then maybe there'll be another wave from here to here. And the number of big mass movements you have per day is dependent upon how many times a day you eat. So if that person is having the standard American diet with three square meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there should be three mass movements of things through the colon a day, and they would have about three bowel movements a day. And that's a pretty healthy bowel. So there is definitely not chemical digestion in the large intestine. There's really just mucus that's being secreted. Uh, there is water that can be absorbed in the large intestine, which is really going to be a function of time. The longer things are in the large intestine, the more it becomes uh, firm. The, it is firmer, more compacted, and can become so firm and compact that uh, it can lead to constipation. All right. Finally, we have the liver, and the liver is friends with the pancreas, and it's not all drawn out for you here. This is a simplistic picture because I'm supposed to just be speaking simply. Why can't I do that? Who knows? Again, not me. All right, the liver makes bile. Bile is created by the liver, and then it flows through this duct called the bile duct. And the gallbladder, which is also not in this picture, stores extra bile. And when there is a signal that there is stretch in the duodenum, meaning that chyme is now in the duodenum, 
that signals to the gallbladder to contract, which increases the pressure in this bile duct and opens up this sphincter down here that we can call the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Hepato for liver and pancreatic, obviously, for the pancreas. So there's sphincters all over the place, all of this incremental movement. So from mouth to esophagus, esophagus to stomach, stomach to small intestine, small intestine to large intestine. Those are sphincters that are controlling each step of this process so that it only happens as fast as we want it to. Because we're dealing with things with really, really large degrees of pH differences that we would normally want in the body, we have these really tight controls. The other thing that has a sphincter, as I just mentioned, is this system. So this bile, which is going to be limited in its movement through the hepatopancreatic sphincter, you may have heard it by its eponymous name. So using somebody's last name, the sphincter of Odi, who is the dude who first have found it slash talked about it. All right. Again, not pictured here. Your liver's on your right side. On your left side is your pancreas. And the pancreas doesn't make bile, but what it does make are things called pancreatic juices. And those juices include um, amylase, so th to break down carbohydrates, lipase to break down fats, and then trypsin, which helps to break down protein. So as these pancreatic juices are created, they flow along this pancreatic duct. It converges with the common bile duct, which is controlled together with that hepatopancreatic sphincter. And again, that opens to allow the passage of bile plus these juices into the small intestine. And that's where we get the chemical digestion. Long story for that answer. So the small intestine definitely engages in chemical digestion, even though most of its products are generally itself mucus related. Um, the release of bile from the liver and juices from the pancreas is going to lead to the largest amount of chemical digestion in the small intestine. All right, the only chemical digestion we would see in the large intestine would be from bacteria. So the large intestine only makes mucus, again, to move things along for fecal adherence. However, there are some things that are broken down by bacteria, and there's some things that are good, and you know we don't mind them being broken down by bacteria. Um, if you're missing an enzyme, so one of the most common deficiencies in the entire world, which is even more interesting when you look at it by breakdown um, across continents and even countries, is, uh, is lactase deficiency. And lactase breaks down lactose into its component sugar products. If you don't have lactase, if you drink anything containing or eat, eat or drink, anything containing lactose, it will have to be broken down by the bacteria in the colon, um, which is okay. I mean, they're trying their best to help. But remember, bacteria do their thing by engaging in fermentation. And fermentation creates gases. So that's why when you have lactose deficiency, you see um, this tendency to pass gas. Um, also, there's a tendency for diarrhea. When you have a lot of gas in any area in the body, but right now in the colon, that messes up what we call the osmotic pressure, which controls the tendency for water to move. So instead of water remaining where it needs to remain, if we mess up that balance, the water will move into the colon, which makes the stool watery and really increases the urge uh, to use the bathroom. So rather than having fecal adherence, we have loose, watery stool. All right, so that's the story. The alimentary canal, external to the body, integral in digestion, the breakdown of macromolecular products into micromolecular usable components.
All right. The medications we're talking about are going to be targeted at limiting the acid damage that can be incurred by either the esophagus and or the duodenum. So looking at the stomach itself, so first of all, we see this great picture. We see the diaphragm here. And remember, a break in something, like if I'm taking a hiatus from work, that would mean I'm taking a break from work, running away to the woods and <laughs> never coming back. Just kidding. I'll be back on Monday. Um, the esophageal hiatus is a break in the diaphragm that allows the esophagus to move through it. And the diaphragm should move unimpeded up and down with respiratory movements. Um, fun fact, it doesn't matter what point you're at in swallowing your respiratory, like whatever point you are in breathing. Um, if you're in the middle of an inhale, it pauses for things to move through this hiatus. Otherwise, it'll get stuck and you will be massively uncomfortable. So there is a pause in the, um, in the respiratory cycle. Pretty, pretty neat. Your brain does that for you. So thanks, brain. All right. So as stuff is moving down, so we're going through the diaphragm. And now we're looking at the components of the stomach. So we said we've got the esophagus that controls passage of things into the stomach. And down here at the uh, esophageal hiatus at the level of the stomach, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, which is labeled on the next picture as well. And the lower esophageal sphincter should only be open when there is an active movement of the bolus moving from the esophagus into the stomach. It is not open all of the time, the LES. That's different than down here at the pyloric sphincter or the pylorus. Remember, the pylorus is generally open a little bit. So there is a partial state of relaxation so that fluid can freely move through the stomach if there are no stomach components, if, there, if there's nothing in the stomach, okay? The stomach has to be empty. If there's anything in the stomach, the pylorus closes because the body is preparing for digestion, which as we just mentioned, requires acid, which is a very low pH, and nothing in the body is equipped to deal with that besides the stomach itself. All right, so first we'll go on to that. So in the abdominal cavity, we're dealing with tissues whose connective outermost layer is gender or are serosal linings. And a serosa or a serosal membrane is the thinnest type of lining in the body. It's very thin, which means it's easy generally for substances to pass through it. All right, then the tunics are the same as what you would see in most other hollow organs of the body. We have the middle muscular layer and in the stomach, just like in the esophagus and the intestines, we have circular muscle and we have longitudinal muscle and they're laying right next to each other and they're both there in that muscular layer. Longitude, I missed some letters, <laughs> longitude. <laughs> no. All right. Then we have the submucosal layer. Submucosal literally means under the mucosa. And the submucosal layer is where I always say the fun stuff, but it's not that fun. It's things like the blood vessels, um, the lymphatic vessels, things of that nature are in the submucosa. So you need the submucosa for blood supply to occur for the organ to stay alive and have energy. Then we have the mucosal layer and the mucosal layer of the stomach is very thick and it's very strong because in order to withstand, if we have a 1.5 pH acid in here, we need to have really strong mucosal linings. And there are, do we see these little holes here? It looks like this is like that. The reason it's drawn like that is there are cell components in the walls of the gastric lining uh, called pits. Fun name. 
little pits. And those pits are lined with cells that uh, secrete different products. Some of them are hormonal, some of them are not, some of them are mucus, some of them are things like intrinsic factor to help you uh, absorb vitamin B12. So those gastric pits um, are literal invaginations or holes inside of the stomach lining that house these cells so that they are protected from the really corrosive acid there. So if we look at a pit like this, it would be lined with all of these gastric cells. So there's gastroendocrine cells, there's mucus cells. And in order to be protected and happy in here, at the neck of these pits, there's something called mucus neck cells. And they make a really thick mucus to block these pits from this low pH acid that would be inside of the stomach. So we need to have strong mucus. And one of the components, not only for the specialized mucus in the neck of these pits, but also to help form this really, I mean, anatomically thick mucosal barrier. It's, um, it's a couple centimeters, like usually at least a centimeter in thickness. One of the biochemical components that's very important in that is something we think of mainly for inflammation, and it's prostaglandin. Prostaglandin is a component of a nice, healthy stomach lining, and it's really the only place in the body that we want prostaglandin. It is an acid. It's made from arachidonic acid, and it helps maintain the integrity of this lining. So that's why you see when you take drugs that block prostaglandin, like aspirin, we can lose some of the integrity of that mucosal barrier. So this is an area in the body where we like prostaglandin. And that part of the story will come back later, not just with aspirin, but also in adjuvant or additional therapies. Okay. The other anatomical thing I want to mention about the stomach itself is the location of the fundus relative to the esophagus. So I'm going to erase this LES and stuff for a second. All right. So when the fundus, first of all, fundus is... Um, in this most simplistic sense, it's the top of something, but more specifically, it's the dome-shaped area furthest from the opening. And the opening we're talking about at this point is the pylorus. So this dome-shaped top. So here's the deal. This lower esophageal sphincter is closed unless we're swallowing food and moving it from the esophagus to the stomach, it should be closed. However, because of this anatomic location of the esophageal hiatus in the stomach, I want you to notice, I drew over it, let's make it more clear. So the fundus is way up here. The lower esophageal sphincter is here. The, what the main point of that is, is if we look at the top of the stomach, we can fill this whole stomach up to the top. We can eat so much food and drink so much fluid that we completely fill this organ. And generally, everybody is different and special though, remember? Yes, one and a half liters is the maximum that should be able to fit into the stomach. And the stomach can fit that much because of a specialized tissue component called rugi. The A is silent, rugi. And rugi are folds in an organ. And um, it's kind of like if you take a piece of paper and you crumple it up you can also open that paper back up again and it'll still be the same size. Nothing changes about that paper. It just has folds in it. You can make it small or you can make it big. That's what rugi allow the stomach to do. They allow the stomach to stretch and fill to its maximum filling capacity without changing the pressure. The bladder also has rugi, so it can fill to its full capacity without having pressure changes, and the uterus can do that as well. So everybody has 
should have two organs with Rugi, and some people have three. So the average person has 2.5 organs with Rugi. All right, so the stomach can fill to about one and a half liters, and we call that our vomiting limit, meaning once you get one and a half liters in here, the stomach is completely full, and it doesn't want to be that full. When you fill the stomach up that much, first of all, what that will do is put a lot of pressure on the diaphragm, and that'll make it hard to breathe. But that also causes things to happen because remember, whenever muscle is stretched, it responds by contracting. When the stomach's overfilled like that, we start to get hiccups. That is the stomach pressing upon the diaphragm, the muscle being stretched and then contracting. Those contractions are called hiccups. Um, we can notice that the stomach is starting to reach its filling capacity when the stomach gets pretty filled. Um, it will touch the diaphragm and cause it to pull down and contract. Remember, it's bell-shaped in its relaxed form, and then it's contracted and flat in its contracted form. So when it stretches the diaphragm, when the stomach stretches the diaphragm, the diaphragm contracts, and that causes a sigh. Um, so that's something you can pay attention to. <clears throat> to actually stop feeding at that point in time because if we were let her if we were letting the system do whatever it wanted to get the sensory information up the vagus and then back down the vagus to alter emptying and relaxation to let more food in and basically to get the message up in the hypothalamus that we're full that we've meet or met like our caloric needs for that specific meal takes about 20 minutes. So we don't know that we're full <laughs> until we're past full, unless we're paying attention to that one little sigh. So when you get to that 1.5, if you try to have anything extra, the stomach will work to eject it by vomiting. And in order to vomit, we need to have the tension on this lower esophageal sphincter go down, right? It's got to become looser so that we could have the reflux, see this word, the reflux for regurgitation, for the food to come back up again. All right, so keep that in mind. If we had the esophagus hitching into the fundus of the stomach, so if it was way here at the top, if we filled the stomach up like this much, we wouldn't get that pressure just because of the anatomy of the system. We wouldn't fill up past this opening because the esophagus the hiatus for it is way down here in the upper third of the stomach, but not the top, we can fill up the stomach to above the point of the hiatus. And when that occurs, again, the body is anticipating getting to the vomiting limit. So you will see that the tension on this lower esophageal sphincter, that guy right there, will go down. That is going to be one of the main etiologic or causes, if you've never heard that, etiology is cause, one of the main etiologic factors in reflux. The other thing I want you to remember uh, etiologically wise is that nothing else in the body aside from the stomach in normal cases, there's diseases where things can change, but in normal healthy situations, the stomach is the only organ that can handle that 1.5 to 3 pH. The duodenum cannot handle it. It has a different lining. The esophagus can definitely not handle it. So we want to keep everything inside of the stomach if it makes its way into the duodenum too soon or back up into the esophagus, then we get damage to those areas. When that tissue is eaten away, so if we look over into this picture, if we start to eat into that mucosal tissue and wear away some of the mucosa, we'll eventually get down to the submucosa. And remember what's there? your vessels. You get bleeding, right? So that is called an ulcer. 
So you'll see that not only can we have ulcers inside of the stomach itself because of anything that takes away from the integrity of that mucosal lining, we can also have not only ulceration and damage to these areas around the esophagus, but also just inflammation and irritation of the esophagus, which we call heartburn. We also see one of the most common sites for an ulcer or ulceration is the duodenum. That's the first place that stuff enters the small intestine, and it is definitely not meant to withstand that low pH. One of the protections there is in the duodenum, even though it doesn't have an adequate lining for that, is one thing we didn't mention that the pancreas makes is bicarbonate. And bicarbonate, that's your alkaline substance that neutralizes that low pH acid. So really, everything needs to be working together perfectly. So we need the anatomy working so that we have the sphincters closing appropriately. We need the right pH. We need the pancreas to make bicarbonate. We need everything working in a very coordinated way. And if anything is broken, then we get the pathology. All right. So here, keep in mind that when we think about these pathologies of the system, we have two components that we need to consider. We need to have the anatomical component, so the physical. See what I mean about things messing up if my hand touches it? We have the anatomical components. Anatomical. <laughs> I won the spelling bee once. I think I said that before, but I can't remember those days anymore. Anatomical, the anatomy. We need to have the sphincters working appropriately. So first of all, we need to have the esophageal sphincter closed. It needs to stay closed unless something is physically moving through there. It should only open when the bolus needs to move from here to here. So it should normally be closed. It should be closed very tightly during any churning and mechanical breakdown of substances in the stomach. We also need the pylorus, the pyloric sphincter closed. That one, again, it's usually open if there's nothing in the stomach. Not wide open, but a little bit relaxed to allow the easy passage of fluids. But when the stomach is churning and mixing and engaging in its muscle movements, we need to have that muscle contracted. All right, so that is going to give us, if we just think of the anatomy right now, a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to maintain its tension necessary to contain this low pH stomach acid in its place. We need to have that close appropriately. So we need to have the sympathetic and parasympathetic system working appropriately. Really the sympathetic nerves, um, because they turn off digestion, there's a little bit of sympathetic input to the sphincter itself because in order to allow movement and of stuff from the esophagus to the stomach, this lower esophageal sphincter needs to relax. And remember, sympathetic nerves turn off digestive processes. So sympathetic nerves allow the relaxation of the sphincter, whereas in normal rest and digest, you know, we want to churn, we want to digest the parasympathetic nerves. And in this case, it's the vagus CNX. The vagus is going to be important for controlling the other nervous system, our gut nervous system, which we'll talk about some other day, in order for that to work, the parasympathetic nervous system needs to turn it on. The sympathetic nervous system turns it off. But simplest way, sympathetic nerves relax the sphincter, the parasympathetic contract it and uh, help everything else happen in the stomach. In this anatomical example, it's just going to help uh, encourage this mixing movement and then um, propulsatory movements. All right, and then also it encourages the closing of the pylorus. So we're not going to, well, okay, 
we will talk a little bit about this. Um, the pylorus, if it's too loose, so if the lower esophageal sphincter is too loose, that's how we get GERD, that reflux, that gastrointestinal reflux disorder. If this is open when it's not supposed to be, we will get the movement of acid and stomach contents up into the esophagus. When that happens, because the esophagus doesn't have the same lining of the stomach, it's going to get inflamed, it's going to get irritated, and inflammation we know ends in itis. So we call this damage slash pain esophagitis, so inflammation of the esophagus. We want to limit esophag esophagitis because what you will see is the lining of the esophagus is going to change. It will become tougher because the body wants to protect its cells from becoming damaged by this acid. And eventually it can physically change. If you remember the conversion of one tissue type to another, that's metaplasia, which is a conversion of tissue type. And that's a specific disorder here that we'll talk about in later slides. But remember, once we get from metaplasia, the next step is dysplasia. So that's your precancerous type of lesion. And dysplasia then can progress into neoplasia, which is cancer. So we don't want esophageal cancer. And it all starts with irritation to the esophagus that's not removed. So it, even though it can seem like it's just an annoying problem to have heartburn um, caused by this reflux, it can also lead to extensive tissue damage and neoplasia. So it's a relatively straightforward way to control this. Um, and we'll see that with Altering the tension of the lower esophageal sphincter, we can limit the filling of the stomach. So we're not getting to that one and a half liters to get to the vomiting limit. So trying to eat smaller meals, chew more thoroughly, which remember makes you feel satiated sooner because you get that mechanical fatigue, that muscle fatigue of the jaw muscles. Um, and you can alter positionality, so having individuals keep their head and neck or upper torso propped up on a few pillows at night uh, because gravity definitely, if you're laying flat like this and the stomach is full, because of gravity pushing on the stomach, it can cause backflow just through, you know, the power of the magnetic pull of the earth. So by, you know, putting that person upwards, we're limiting that. Also not eating within a few hours of going to bed. Food stays in your stomach. You know, everything is 1.5 to 3 with the stomach. One and a half to three hours, one to three hours usually, depending on the protein content. So if you don't eat within three hours of going to bed, there shouldn't be anything in the stomach. You won't have that much to worry about. Um... Also, smoking, so nicotine, because nicotine binds to nicotinic type receptors, which are on parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves, which we just learned are involved in both of these processes. And I said sympathetic is going to lower the tension of this lower esophageal sphincter because it needs to open. Um, if we have nicotinic substances entering the body, it will bind to receptors in that area and stimulate it. So smoking lowers the tension of this sphincter. And spoiler alert, nicotine also lowers the tension of the pylorus sphincter. Again, because the nicotinic receptors are stimulated by nicotine, which we only really want in this case being stimulated by acetylcholine from sympathetic or parasympathetic projections. If the pyloric valve is open, not only can we get, like if it was completely open um, in that dumping disorder, the problem would be undigested food in the stool. But if it's just the tension that's altered and it's not tightly closed, but it's just a little bit closed, you'll get the movement of that really acidic chyme 
entering the duodenum before we have the pancreas adding its hydro or its um, bicarbonate to the mix. So we don't want that really low pH acid in the duodenum. So smoking is related to lower tension in both of these sphincters. And finally, there's one more thing that smoking does that really messes up this system. Nicotine also lowers the production of bicarbonate by the pancreas. So you have leaky sphincters, low production of bicarbonate. You've really got this perfect storm for ulceration of the duodenum. And just anatomically, the duodenum is a common place to get ulceration because it's first in line from the stomach. It's the first to receive the content. So if we don't have the bicarbonate there to neutralize those contents, then it is the only thing really at risk of being really damaged by it besides the esophagus, which shouldn't. But this is the natural anatomical pathway of things out of the stomach. So you'll you'll hear about people like, um, there's, we call them neurogenic, neuro meaning brain in this case, and genic comes from the word genesis, genic, which means to create. So a neurogenic ulcer means that it's created by the brain. So that would be a result of stress, right? So a high amount of, in this case, because it's brain related, it would be psychological stress. Uh, so psychological stress, it's a fun little positive feedback loop. When uh, people have very high uh, stress jobs, they have a higher likelihood of smoking. And then smoking alters bicarbonate expression and tension of these sphincters. So you really um, introduce a lot more risk factors uh, besides lung-related ones in with nicotine. All right, so things like Again, not overfilling the stomach, positionality issues, and, you know, small meals throughout the day. Those things can help with controlling a lot of the symptoms that can pop up that are really just caused by the sphincters not closing appropriately. All right, so we went through the anatomical components, which had to do with mainly the tension of the sphincters, which we learned are controlled by the nerves. They can be altered by certain substances, by overfilling, so mass of the abdomen. So those are going to be mainly muscular, right? So it's anatomical in the placement of many things, which we can't help that. We can't really change the anatomy, but we can change things like the tension on the sphincters. So those are going to be related to all of those mechanical things we talked about. So there was a reason we broke it down between mechanical and chemical digestion. So we can target some of those things. Again, behaviorally, um, the medications that we'll go over work really well. That's an important point too. They work great. And if they do work, that means you don't have to go on, hopefully, to find alternate interventions besides the behavioral ones, which they would hopefully institute first. And maybe those will work and you don't even need the medications. That would be best case scenario. But um, aside from the behavioral, the next steps are going to involve altering the chemical aspects of digestion. And that means we're going to start here with the stomach and what things physically are going to alter acid expression. All right, so the first thing that I want you to just understand in general, so we call these peptic ulcers if they're in the stomach itself. And the reason for that is these gastric pits I mentioned. So in these pits, there's all these cell types Uh, that are making things. So in this picture, it looks like we have giant cells. They are not giant. They're tiny. You have to look underneath a microscope to see them. And there's tons of them. Lucky for all of us, right? There's tons of different cells in this area. 
One of the cells that is not on this picture, but you can know because you like being smart, they are called chief cells. And chief cells make a very large, um, what's it, like a polypeptide. They're a large protein. So they're a pro-substance. It's called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. And in order for pepsinogen to become pepsin, it needs to be cleaved or cut from its big structure of pepsinogen, which is the raw product made by chief cells. The other guy around in the stomach, that hydrochloric acid, is going to aid in cleaving pepsinogen into pepsin. So why do chief cells secrete pepsinogen out into the stomach and not just pepsin? Well, remember I said the P in pepsin should also clue you into the P for protein. Pepsin digests protein. And our organs, and pretty much all of us, all our stuff, it's made of protein. So if we just secreted pepsin out of these cells, well, guess what? They would digest all of this. So instead, they secrete this pro substance, this large peptide substance, pepsinogen, which then has to be cleaved into pepsin. So pepsin, that's our protein type acid, and it's not as acidic as hydrochloric acid. So we don't want it around in high concentrations. We definitely don't want it digesting our own organs. Um, but we would consider it the less damaging of the two types of acid. Where hydrochloric acid, you might know you can dissolve most things in hydrochloric acid. Very low pH, very caustic, very good at breaking stuff down. It's great at breaking down plant cell walls. It can break down everything. <laughs> it can break down a body. It can break down protein. But in your stomach, it's very good at breaking down or, um, plant cell walls walls, if you just want to characterize them for simplicity's sake. All right. So anyways, the chief cells are making pepsinogen. And then we have, if we follow this picture, it's going to go backwards. We have these things called parietal cells. They do a lot of stuff. We can't live that well without them because they also secrete intrinsic factor, which binds to vitamin B12 so that we can absorb it. So we need them. We can't just get rid of all the parietal cells in the body because we need intrinsic factor. We need B12 so we can make blood cells and stem cells and all the stuff we need to live. The other thing that parietal cells do is secrete a product, one piece of hydrochloric acid. And what they pump out is hydrogen. So H plus Cl, hydrochloric acid. H plus, that's a proton. Parietal cells pump out using a pump. They pump out a proton. They pump out hydrogen. Hydrogen is an acid. That hydrogen combines with chloride to make hydrochloric acid. So let that name clue you in. Parietal cells use a pump to pump out hydrogen. Hydrogen is a proton. We call those protein or proton pumps. Might sound familiar, right? Because we use drugs called proton pump inhibitors to alter acid production in the stomach. And the reason why is because parietal cells, they pump out hydrogen, okay? And when hydrogen is around, it should only really be created when we have food in the stomach. Well, how do we know we have food in the stomach? That is because of, again, one is stretch, because we've got muscle lining all of this. So we know that when muscle is stretched, it responds by contracting, which is great. But in this case, it is going to signal to the brain because we have mechanoreceptors in that area. And those mechanoreceptors are going to sense stretch. So when they sense stretch, they carry forth a message to our gastric nervous system, our um, parasympathetic nervous system, and local cells right here in the pits, they are called G cells. 
And that's a great name. And I say that because they are named G-cells because G-cells make gastrin. Gastrin, so we know the stomach is gastric. It's the gastric area of the body. Gastrin is so named because it is the main excitatory hormone, main excitatory substance in the stomach. Whenever gastrin is around, it turns on everything. It turns up all the muscle stuff, so you get churning, okay? But in this slide where we're talking about the chemical things, it encourages acid secretion. And it does that in a variety of ways. One of which we can see very clearly right here, gastrin has receptors that it binds to on the surface of cells called ECL cells, which is short for enterochromaffin-like cells. Chromaffin cells are in the adrenal medulla. These cells kind of look like them and function like them. So we call them entero, meaning GI tract, entero, like enteritis is inflammation of the intestine. So entero, so in the GI tract, chromaffin-like cells, ECL cells. So gastrin binds to receptors on the surface of enterochromaffin-like cells. And in response to that, the ECL cells themselves make histamine. That histamine is your feed-forward mechanism. It's a positive feedback because it binds to its receptors, its histamine receptors on the parietal cell. And in response to that and the gastrin, the parietal cells will turn on their hydrogen proton pumps. There's one other piece of the story. So let's move over here and where we're just looking at one parietal cell. You might know that there's two types of histamine receptors in the body. There is histamine type 1, which are on mast cells, and there's histamine type 2, which are on parietal cells. So when we look at these parietal cells, there's three receptors on them. There's a gastrin receptor, there's a histamine receptor, a type 2 histamine receptor, and there's an acetylcholine receptor. In order to get this proton pump on, pumping out the highest amount of hydrochloric acid, so we would call that the full expression of gastric acid. We need all three of these substances to bind together. So we need acetylcholine to come here. Let me make that green. We need acetylcholine to come and bind to its receptor here. And the acetylcholine, that's part of the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Our rest and digest. So the vagus nerve is going to be spitting out acetylcholine to the various ganglia in the region, the postganglionic cell will release acetylcholine. That would be a muscarinic type receptor that it binds to because it's on an organ tissue itself. So the muscarinic type receptor will bind acetylcholine. And in this part of the body, acetylcholine is excitatory. It allows the influx of positive ions like calcium, which are going to drive up the charge of the cell, making it more likely to do something. So it's going to be depolarized. Further, we will have gastrin, which we know is local. It's coming from the G cells because when there's stretch in the stomach, we're going to get this local response that there's something in there and we're going to get the production of gastrin by the G cells. And that gastrin is going to be released. It's going to affect the muscular tissue in the area, and it's also going to bind to its receptor here on the parietal cell. So that gastrin also is excitatory. It is a pore channel that allows the influx of calcium as well, further driving up the charge and depolarizing this parietal cell. Finally, we mentioned that when this gastrin bound to these ECL cells, they, in response to that, spit out histamine. And that histamine was going to feed forward and stimulate the parietal cell. Well, that is right here. When histamine 
is released by the enterochromaffin-like cells. It binds to the histamine type 2 receptors on the parietal cell, which utilize ATP to create a second messenger substance called cyclic AMP, which is a great energy source. In order for a pump to run, it needs to have energy. So the histamine is essentially going to be, in the most simplistic sense for you, is going to be our energy source utilizing ATP to turn on this pump. And this pump is a special type of transporter. It is going to exchange things. Remember that um, potassium is really high inside of cells and it's low outside of cells. So that means that it would naturally flow outwards and wouldn't need any help. We don't want potassium, you know, doing what it normally would um, and flowing out of the cell. So potassium is always controlled really tightly in its concentration inside of a cell. So if we want it to move opposite its concentration gradient, meaning potassium and everything else moves from high to low concentration. If we want something to move against its concentration gradient, we need to use active transport. And we call it active because it utilizes energy. It utilizes ATP. And we call a lot of these pumps or these transporters ATP aces, right? Enzymes are just proteins. Proteins are stuff like transporters. So these pumps run on ATP, which need, means you need to be breathing for them to run. If you didn't have enough ATP for them to run, you wouldn't be breathing and you have bigger things to worry about than your parietal cell pump function. So we have these pumps on to tightly control potassium entry and exit into the cell. Anyways, these proton pumps are called that because they exchange one hydrogen ion out for one potassium ion in. When this cell, when this parietal cell becomes stimulated enough, when it gets to the charge it needs to get to, to have an action, it is depolarized by the entry of just enough positive ions like calcium in order to turn on this protein pump. So in order to get to that charge, we should have gastrin, histamine, and acetylcholine binding to its receptors and turning on this proton pump. And as we mentioned, that H+, plus, that's our proton, that's going to combine and make hydrochloric acid which is also in a, it's in a different pump here. Let's do one thing at a time. But it does combine to make that so that we have hydrochloric acid being pumped out into the stomach. So if you've been paying attention and using your brain a little bit, you might have an idea of how these drugs work. So we've got two big families that we're going to learn about first. We've got our protein pump inhibitors. You can make a good guess, I bet, because I know you're smart. I bet you can make a great guess where those are going to work. Those are going to interfere with the activity of this pump right over here. So proton pump inhibitors are going to interfere with this proton pump. Less hydrogen, less hydrochloric acid we will not have such a low pH. We'll still have these two things binding. So we'll still have acid. It just won't be at that very, very low pH, which can be damaging. The other class of medications we'll talk about are our histamine type 2 antagonists. You can probably guess how those work. Histamine type 2 antagonists are targeting this part of the cascade. They bind to those histamine type 2 receptors. They are competitive for the histamine that's created by the enterochromaffin-like cells. If the histamine can't bind, we're not going to get cyclic AMP. Without cyclic AMP, we're not going to have good activation of this proton pump. We're still going to have depolarization of the cell and some activity, but we're not going to have full hydrochloric acid expression. So that's the story of the chemical 
digestion and how we can alter that to limit the production of acid, limit the pH of the acid expression, and then limit the damage to the system due to this low pH stuff entering areas not equipped with a thick mucosal lining to protect itself from it. All right, that's it for that talk, everybody. Hope you enjoyed and stay smart.